Would you open with me to 1 John chapter 4? 1 John chapter 4. And this morning we will be looking at verses 1 to 6. And so if you are able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. And this is the word of God. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Verse 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. May God bless the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Well, would you join me in a quick word of prayer before we dive into the text and see what God might have to say to us this morning? Father, we do thank you again for this time, and I do pray that as we turn to your word, that you would help us to to give it its full attention, the attention that is due to your word. I pray, Lord, that in the midst of all of the distractions, and in the midst of all that is going on in, in the background, I pray that you would give us the grace to set those things aside. I pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes, that you would give us ears to hear, and I pray that this text would encourage us and equip us this morning, and I pray that you would do all of this for your own glory, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've titled the sermon this morning, A Call for doctrinal discernment, a call for doctrinal discernment. And I wonder if you're aware this morning that passive and idle living is not a fruit of the gospel. We talk often about what the gospel is, and we talk often about the fact that God saves us and he justifies us and he brings us into the state of grace all by himself. And we are completely passive in God's work of justifying and saving his people. In other words, when it comes to justification and salvation, we play no part. But I wonder if you're aware that we do play a part in our own sanctification. In other words, I I wonder if you're aware of the fact that the gospel, when it is really received, it produces real fruit. It, It produces fruit in the people of God. God has indeed called us out of a state of sin and death, and He has called us into the state of grace, in salvation by Jesus Christ, as the Second London Confession says. But in doing that, in placing us into the state of grace and salvation, God has now equipped us with everything that we need to live according to His Word and to live in this world as those who belong to Him. The Apostle Paul says this in In Titus, he says, Jesus Christ 
gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And one of those good works is testing the teaching of men to see whether or not they are from God. In other words, one of the good works that God has equipped us and called us to is to test the teaching that we hear. If you're a believer this morning, God has called you to grow in doctrinal discernment so that you might be able to test the teaching that you hear, whether it's in your church, whether it's in another church that you're attending, whether it's on your phone, or whether it's anywhere else, the teaching that you're hearing, God is calling you to grow in doctrinal discernment so that you might be able to test it. And I think as we work our way through the text, that point will become clear. So that brings us to our first point this morning, which I have called the duty to discern. The duty to discern. And we see this from verse 1 in our text. And really this point comes from the observation that the Apostle John, as he is writing verse 1, he is writing in the imperative mood. In other words, he's writing a command. In fact, as John writes verse 1, we find two commands. He says, number one, beloved to the saints, to the people of God, to those who are beloved by God. Here's the first command. Do not believe every spirit. Here's the second command. But test the spirits. In other words, as we read verse 1, we're not reading a suggestion from the Apostle John. He isn't suggesting anything. In fact, he is commanding something with full apostolic authority. He, he writes out two commands. And I find it interesting that the commands that we read in verse 1 follow the assertion that proceeded back in chapter 3, verse 24. Remember, the last time we were in 1 John, the very last words that we heard was that God has given His Spirit to us. And it's only after that assertion that John follows in, verse, in chapter 4 with two commands. And I just find that not only interesting, but also informative. This is the pattern in the Christian life. You have a statement of truth that rests upon faith and union with Christ. That is, God has given you His Spirit. There's nothing we did to earn that. That was the grace of God being lavished upon the people of God. And so here is our pattern. The grace of God, He has given us His Spirit and then commands that follow, that inform our new way of life as we walk according to the Spirit of God. And so we see that pattern here. As John says in chapter 3 that God gave us His Spirit, and then in chapter 4 he moves in to giving us two commands. And the first is do not believe every spirit. Now, I think the context makes it clear that John is using the word spirit in place of the word teacher. That you can think of the two terms as synonymous as John uses them here in this context. We can see this later in, well, if we just drop down a few lines in verse 1, John's going to refer to many false prophets. So when he says to don't believe every spirit, he's talking about teachers. And he's saying that there is this reality that, that there are some who speak, 
according to a false spirit. And then there are some on the other end who speak according to the Spirit of God. That's what he's saying here. Uh, We can also see this down in verses 5 and 6 where John is going to kind of refer to the to the same group and he's going to make the same contrast between the spirits but he's going to use the pronouns we and they in verse 5 and so when John uses the word spirits here in verse 1 he is using the term synonymously for teachers those who claim to be speaking on behalf of God the idea here is that behind all teaching There is either the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Antichrist. Um, Drop down in verse 6. John uses the term the Spirit of truth and the Spirit of error. So, So the idea here is that behind all teaching, there is either a Spirit of error or a Spirit of truth, uh, the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of the Antichrist. And John says, do not believe every teacher who comes to you and says, I am speaking on behalf of God. Just because they say that, you are not to believe that. That's what John's saying in the first command. So then he follows that up with a second command and says, on the other hand, test the spirits. Test the spirits. I want you to notice he tells us the purpose of our testing. He says, test the spirits to see whether they are from God. In other words, that is why you should test the spirits. What you're wanting to know is whether or not they are from God. So he gives us the the reason for our testing or the purpose. And secondly, he gives us the reason. In other words, why do we have to do this? Well, look at verse 1 again. He tells us, for, in other words, here's why you have to do this. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. The presence of false teachers means that for as long as we're in this age... We will need to test the spirits to see whether or not they are from God. And the idea of testing here is to examine something to determine whether or not it's genuine. To examine something in order to determine whether or not it's genuine. It's helpful to look at this word in other contexts. The Apostle Paul uses this word in 1 Timothy 3.10. And if you're familiar with 1 Timothy, you know in the third chapter, at least in the first half of it, he's giving qualifications for the two offices in the church. And he says if you're going to appoint an elder, here's the standard that he must meet. And then he also says if you're going to appoint deacons, here's the standard they must meet. And so there in that context, he uses our word to test. And he's writing to Timothy, and he tells them, make sure you test the deacons first. Make sure, in other words, here's what he's saying, make sure their godliness is genuine. And only after you've done that, then appoint them to the office of deacon. And interestingly, this word is also found in Revelation 2.2. And I think that text is also very clarifying as to what John means when he says to test. And, and I find it interesting that it was, it was Timothy who received that instruction from Paul to test. And remember where Timothy was? He was in the Ephesian church. And then you get over to the book of Revelation. And the Ephesian church is the one who receives... This commendation. Here's what we read in Revelation 2 2. The church is commended for not bearing with those who are evil, but for testing those who call themselves apostles and are not. 
And in Revelation 2, 2, the commendation is you, you tested them and you found them to be false. The implication is that you didn't listen to them. And so the Ephesian church is being commended for testing false teachers, for examining those who claimed to be apostles. There's an interesting thought for today for those who might claim such things in our present age as well. But nevertheless, it seems that the Ephesian church knew what it meant to be a discerning people. That's the point here. They tested, and then they rejected those who were not genuine. And the Apostle John is writing to the church, and he's saying to the church, you must learn to do the same thing. You must learn how to do that which the Ephesian church learned how to do. And that's the duty of the saints in this present age, because the reality that we live in is such that false prophets and false teachers and false apostles rise up in our midst and claim to speak on behalf of God. And so what a timely word this is for the people of God today. If you just think about our context, there are Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, and prosperity gospel preachers. And they're all claiming to be Christian. Those are really the the classic examples of of false prophets and and of false teaching. But, But I suggest that there's an even more subtle form of false teaching that is present in the church today, that is fairly more recent. I heard in an interview, it was an older interview, but nevertheless... This week I listened to an interview, and in this interview, there was a practicing trans man. In other words, a man pretending to be a woman. And he says this in this interview. And and by the way, he's commended for this by the audience. He says, by the way, as a Christian, I find it offensive that they... And in the context, they were referring to the quote-unquote religious right. He says, by the way, as a Christian, I find it offensive that they would leverage Christ's teachings in order to hate us, in order to reject us, in order to oppose us. There is a form of false teaching in the church today that says Christ not only supports but encourages high-handed rebellion against God. And our culture says you can't offend someone by telling them that their truth is not the truth about God. How dare you make objective claims? That's the world we're living in. And so into this kind of situation the word of God speaks to us the people of God and it brings to us sanity and it brings to us authority and it says to us there is truth and there is error and to the people of God it says you must learn to discern between the two And so you have to understand this morning that you are not free to believe what you want about God. The people of God must learn sound doctrine. And then they must weigh the words of men and of any who claim to be teaching on behalf of God against it. We must test those who claim to speak the truth. And we must reject all that turns out to be false. And so if you're a believer here this morning, it is your duty, according to the Word of God, to develop doctrinal discernment. And this is your duty whether you're young, whether you're young in the faith, or or you're young in terms of your age, or whether you're old. 
This is our duty. And when we stand before God, may it be said of us what was said of the Ephesian church. You tested those who called themselves true teachers and you found them to be false. That is our duty. And so if you're hearing that and saying to yourself, okay, I'm, I'm convinced that I am called to this. God is writing a command to his people here, which means he's commanding me to test the spirits. Maybe you're, you're convinced of that, but the next thought is, well, I'm not quite sure how to grow in doctrinal discernment. I, I'm not quite sure how, how this looks. If I were to pick up my phone today and turn to, to any preacher on YouTube or wherever it is, how can I discern what is being said? How do I know if that is a true teacher or a false teacher? Well, the Apostle John did us a great service in the following verses. Because in verses 2 to 6, he begins to teach us. He begins to show us how to do that which we're commanded to do in verse 1. In other words, he gives us the tools that we need in order to grow in doctrinal discernment. And so that really brings us to our second point. Our first point this morning is that we have a duty to discern. The second point I have titled the tools of discernment. Because if you'll notice as we work our way through the rest of the text, as we work our way through verses 2 to 6, the Apostle John is giving us the tools so that we might use them and test the teaching that we hear. So that brings us to our second point, the tools of discernment. It, and it seems clear to me that, that the entirety of verses 2 to 6 are intended to teach us how to discern. Why do I say that? Well, if you'll notice the first words in verse 2, we read, By this you know. So in other words, whatever he's about to say is going to tell us how we can know whether or not this person is a true teacher or a false teacher. So we know that at least verse 2 is about this, but then notice what's the very last words in verse 6. Look down to verse 6 and you'll see it is the very same words. By this we know. So if verse 2 begins with, by this we know, and verse 6 ends with, by this we know, I think it is abundantly clear that everything in verses 2 to 6 is intended to teach us how to discern. And so that brings us really to our first sub-point, which is found in verses 2 to 3, which I'm calling a common Christian confession. The first tool that the Apostle John gives us that we might use in order to test the teaching we hear and to test those who claim to be teaching on behalf of God, the first tool is what I've called a common Christian confession. Look at verse 2 with me. By this you know the Spirit of God. And then we drop down to verse 3. By this you may know the spirit of Antichrist. So, so here is how you can discern between the spirit of God and the spirit of Antichrist. By this you may know. And then he says, every spirit that confesses. And the contrast in verse 3 is every spirit that does not confess. And so the first test has to do with what a person confesses. In other words, how does this person articulate what they believe to be true about certain doctrines? What's interesting here is that John is, is going to say that those who are from God, they all agree upon a certain confession. In other words, they all confess the same thing 
And those who don't confess that which the people of God do confess, John says, they are the ones who are false. That's how you may know. I just find it interesting. There is sort of a, some pushback on this idea of confessional Christianity in our day. It sort of seems like a, a foreign concept to the Christian faith. I just find that to be thoroughly uninformed according to texts like this. The, the practice of, of uniting ourselves as a church and as the, as the invisible church and as the visible church around clearly defined and commonly confessed truths is a practice given to us by the apostles themselves. This isn't something that was made up in the 15th or 16th century. This is something that goes all the way back to the 1st century. There, there began all the way back in the 1st century to, to be a body of truth that was well-defined and commonly confessed by the people of God. And John is saying, by this confession, you may know whether someone is a true teacher or whether someone is a false teacher. He's telling us, this confession will help you. And so what is it that the Apostle John has in mind when he talks about that which true teachers and true believers all commonly confess together. What is the confession that is in view here in our text? Well, look with me. He says, every spirit that confesses, okay, what follows is the content of the confession, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. There's the confession that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. John says every believer and every teacher that is really from God confesses that truth. And this, by this truth, by this confession, here is how you will know if they're from God. And if they reject that confession, that's how you know they are not from God. In fact, they are from Antichrist, according to the text. And so, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Here is what every true teacher must believe. Here is what every true teacher must teach. Here is what every false teacher will reject. And here is what every false believer will believe. That Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Now, as I was studying the, the content of this confession this week, I stumbled across Calvin and a number of others who bring out the full implication of what, what it means to say and to agree that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And as I began to study it, I realized that there was so much more to this confession and to this statement than is initially Seen. And I think that Calvin and all of the others who say the same thing, I think they're exactly right. There are three distinct truths that are found in this confession. In saying, if you believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, you believe really three distinct things at the very least. Number one, when we say Jesus Christ has come, we're implying that He existed before His incarnation. In other words, we're not saying that Jesus Christ was created. We're not saying that the incarnation was the creation of Jesus Christ when we say Jesus Christ has come. Because if you say that, you are assuming and implying that He existed beforehand. The man, Jesus Christ, is the eternal Son of God who assumed humanity in the Incarnation. And so those who would, de would deny the divine nature of Christ, those who would deny the eternality of the Son of God, they must be false teachers. And so by this, you, you may know. That's the first 
implication. The second, when we say that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, the implication here is is that Jesus Christ is both truly divine and truly human. If your version of Jesus is not truly divine and truly human at the same time, then you do not believe in Jesus Christ. The implication here is that in the person of Jesus, you have both a truly divine nature and a truly human nature, which is altogether free from sin. And so those who deny the humanity of Christ cannot be from God. And actually, it seems that that this was the error that the Apostle John was confronting in his day. There seemed to be those in the first century who who were coming into the church and who who had this duality view of, of the spirit and the body that was completely out of accord with Scripture, and and their view was that anything physical was inherently bad, and so Jesus couldn't have been truly physical. He couldn't have been truly human. John is saying, if you hear anyone say or deny the humanity of Christ, you may know right then and there that they are false teachers, and they do not speak on behalf of God. The third implication here is that the mention of Christ's coming in the flesh implies the reason or the end for which he came. I think Calvin is absolutely correct in drawing this out. To say that Christ came is to have in your mind the reason why he came. You see, it isn't enough to just say that Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, came and assumed humanity and lived upon this earth just to do what we all do ourselves. No, when you say Jesus Christ came in the flesh, you're implying also the end for which He came. The Lord Jesus came to live a perfect life. Because none of us could live a perfect life. He came to die upon the cross. Because if He didn't die upon the cross, we all would have borne the wrath of God ourselves. If He did not take our place in hanging upon that cross, in drinking the full cup of God's wrath, then every single one of us would have been liable to bear that wrath ourselves. But Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Why? To take our place. And not only to live perfectly and to take our place upon the cross, but also to rise triumphantly on the third day. To conquer death. So that in Him we might also be freed from death. The sting of death is gone, Paul says. Because of what Christ has done. You see, when we talk about Christ coming in the flesh, we have in our mind the fact that the reason why He came was to undo everything that the first Adam did and to do everything that the first Adam failed to do. And this is the truth that we must believe about Jesus Christ. If you add any of your works to Christ's work, you're denying this truth because you're saying that His work was not enough. And so we cannot add to the work of Christ. Do you believe that this morning? To believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh along with all of its implications is what it means to be a Christian. You become a Christian, not by doing something, but by believing upon Jesus Christ as He is presented to us and declared to us in the Word of God. You become a Christian by believing in Jesus. And Jesus is not open for you to interpret. Jesus is revealed to us in the Scriptures. And it is by believing in Him that we become Christian. 
Have you done that this morning? Have you believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has come in the flesh in order to redeem us from our sin? Or have you been deceived by believing in someone else? Whether it be in yourself or whether it be in another person or prophet or or whether it be in any other object, if the object of your faith this morning is not the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have been deceived. You see, the grace of God comes to us in a time of need. And He comes to us by way of His Word, and He says and He commands all men everywhere, turn from your sin and turn from your idols. Stop trusting in something other than Christ. And by the grace of God, He will grant you the gift of faith and repentance. And in this very moment, you can turn to Christ and be saved. Have you done that this morning? The Apostle John says, If a teacher denies any of these truths, they are not from God. And so here is the common Christian confession that John says will be of use to you as you discern between true teachers and false teachers. As you weigh the words that you hear. The problem is is that we have almost, it seems, unlimited resources today. You see, all we have to do is open up our phone and we can we we essentially have access to unlimited teaching the apostle john says weigh what you hear against these words weigh those who claim to be speaking the truth against these words when you deal with people when you deal with teachers when you're considering in your own mind teaching and and Teachers, you have to go further than simply asking the question, Do you believe in Jesus Christ? You have to go further. You must ask, What do you believe to be true about Jesus Christ? And you will know enough about the, those whom you're hearing by their response to that question. There's John's point this morning. And so I want to ask a question to the believers in the room this morning. Do you know Christ well enough to use this test effectively? You see, you may weigh false teachers and true teachers by knowing who Christ is. And so I want to ask all of us who believe in in Jesus Christ, do we know Him well enough to use this test effectively if we ask someone the question this morning not only i want to know not only if you believe in jesus but i want to know what you believe to be true about jesus if you ask that question are you equipped and well prepared to judge the answer according to the word of god and according to your knowledge of your savior if the answer is no May I simply suggest to you that you ought to fix your eyes upon your Savior and that you ought to do it more often and that you ought to walk with Him daily until you learn of Him. And when you finally know Him well enough, well, then you will know those who don't know Him. So there is one tool, there is one test that the Apostle John gives us. There is a common Christian confession and it centers upon the person of Christ. And if you know that, and if you know Christ, John says, you will be able to discern doctrinally. You'll be able to discern between true teachers and false teachers. There's the first tool. 
The second tool is found in verse 4, and I have called it a necessary reminder. In other words, when you are growing in doctrinal discernment, when you are using the tools of discernment to test the teaching that you hear, apparently the Apostle John thought that we all need to be reminded of something. And so look with me at verse 4. He says, in the midst of giving us these tools, he says, Little children, you are from God, and you have overcome them. That is, you belong to God, and you already have victory over these false teachers. That's the starting point for the people of God. And you have to know that this morning. Your starting point, as you begin to grow in discernment, is one of victory in Christ. There's our starting point. But notice the reason why this is true. And here is where I think the tool really comes in. Here is the the heart of the Apostle John in verse 4. Why is this true? Why have we already overcome them? For, there's our three-lettered little word that is so helpful to us as we read the Scriptures. Why is this so? For, in other words, here's the reason why. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In other words, the Apostle John says, You need to know that false teachers will not overcome you. He says that in the first part of verse 4. There's no need, in other words, to fear false teachers. But you also need to know that this is true not because of anything within you, but because of the one who is within you, the one who is in you. This is why this is true, he says. Because the Spirit of God has taken up residence in your life. And this really puts everything into perspective as we begin to grow in doctrinal discernment. In other words, as you're learning how to discern doctrine and as you're learning how to tell the difference between a true teacher and a false teacher, you may not rest in the thought that you in yourself are either strong or wise. John says that is not your hope. As you're growing in doctrinal discernment, you may not think to yourself, oh, well, I have become so wise and understanding among men. Who is there that is as wise as me? I can discern all truth. John is saying, hold on a second. You need to be reminded of something. You overcome them because of He that is in you. And because He is greater than the one who is in the world. Not because you're greater than the one who is in the world. Not because you're wiser than false teachers. Not because you have more strength in and of yourself than false teachers and false prophets do. And so the reminder really is that we must rest in the fact that God is our strength and His Word is our wisdom. There's the reminder as we begin to grow in discernment. And So may I simply say this morning, do not stand against false teachers and do not stand against false teaching in your own strength. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And he is greater in power, and he is greater in worth, and he is greater in authority, and he is greater in majesty. Calvin said here, Satan is wonderfully artful in deceiving. But in this whole spiritual warfare, this thought, the thought from verse 4, ought to dwell in our hearts As God repels our enemies while we repose, victory is certain. But you must remember that it is God 
repelling your enemies. So here's a helpful tool as you grow in doctrinal discernment. Lean upon Christ, not yourself. He has become to us the wisdom of God. So he gives us first a common Christian confession, and by it we may discern. He gives us a helpful reminder, and, and by it we have perspective as we discern. But I want, to, I want you to notice lastly, in verses 5 to 6, he gives us a third tool. And I have called this third tool a helpful hallmark. A helpful hallmark. There is a hallmark of all teaching. And by it you may discern true and false teachers. Here's the final tool that John gives us. I'm going to read verses 5 to 6 and then we'll unpack it. He says, They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. That verb there, listens, is going to be important for us as we understand this hallmark. You'll notice it, it appears again and again and again in two short verses. Okay, The world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there are a few things to notice here in verses 5 to 6 in order to understand what John is saying. Notice the contrast between verse 5 and verse 6. In verse 5, John begins with the they. Okay, notice that. The, the main subject in verse 5 is they. And in contrast to that, the main subject is we. So first and foremost, between verses 5 and 6, there's a contrast between the they and the we. So we have to identify who this is. I think they is clearly a reference to the false teachers, to the false prophets who are mentioned in verse 1. Clearly. Now the we is a little bit harder to define, but I think it's clear because if you was a reference to the saints in verse 4, well then I think we must be a reference to a more narrow group in verse 5. I think we, in this text, is a reference not to the saints, but to the apostles. In other words, there is a contrast in our final point between the false prophets and between the true prophets, we could say, the apostles of God. Why? Well, because the saints are referred to in verse 4, the false teachers are referred to in verse 5, and then in verse 6, the true teachers, the apostles. And so what we have here is a contrast between false teachers and true teachers. And there is a contrast between the hallmark of all false teachers and the hallmark of all true teachers. And so what is it? Well, again, the, the, word, the, the verb that appears again and again and again, this idea of those who listen. In other words, you may know by, by those who listen is what he's saying. I, I think that that helps us here. So notice John says, we're thinking now, what is the hallmark of all false teaching? And on the other end, what is the hallmark of all true teaching? Well, he tells us first about the false teaching. And he says that the false teachers, they speak from the world. That is, their speech is ungodly, it is, it is worldly, okay? Ungodly, worldly speech is a hallmark of false teaching, and you have to understand that ungodly and worldly speech has to do with more than simply the words that we use. But we know this today because people love to use Christian words like justice and equity and righteousness, right? But those are the key terms of our culture today. 
But when we hear that, we have to realize that they have stolen the term and have redefined it according to their own distorted worldview. So worldly speech runs deeper than the, than the bare word being used. How are we defining our terms is the question we have to ask. The hallmark of false teaching is that they will use worldly speech. The second hallmark, the one that John highlights here, the one that John is going to contrast with in verse 6, is that the world listens to them. There's the hallmark of all false teaching. The world listens to them. That is, you may know who the false teachers are by observing the kind of people that follow them. That's what John is saying here. False teachers will have a worldly following. False teachers will have a following of false beliefs. There's the hallmark, according to the Apostle John, behind all false teaching. They speak worldly words, but they also have a worldly following. Why? Because it's the world that listens to worldly teachers. The hallmark of all worldly false teaching is that the world loves it. Matthew Henry said here something along the lines of the world will follow its own. That's exactly what the Apostle John is saying here. And this, this is actually true. The, the, you, we can even see this in churches. Because the, that which is taught and, and preached from the pulpit is normally related to that which is believed by the people sitting in the pews. This is why... Those who say women can preach are full of what? Women preachers. This is why those who say that God is in favor of high-handed rebellion in the form of the transgender or the LGBTQ movement, this is why when you have a, a pulpit that affirms that kind of behavior and says that God is, is encouraging that and, and God is in favor of it and, and love is love, when you hear that from the pulpit, guess what you will have in the pews? People who believe it. You will know the kind of teaching by the kind of people who listen to that teaching is what John says. And you will know false teachers because the world will follow them. If that's the hallmark of all false teaching, and John is contrasting the hallmarks, well then the hallmark of all true teaching must be the opposite, right? That's exactly what he says in verse 6. Notice with me, the hallmark of all true teaching is exactly the opposite. He says, we, that is the apostles. In other words, think to yourself, the true teachers. The ones who teach in accordance with the Spirit of God. He says, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. That is, true teachers who speak the word of God and who preach the truth that has once and for all been handed down to the saints, they will be accompanied by true believers. That's what John is saying here. True teachers will be heard by true believers. True teachers will be accompanied by those who truly know God. That is what the Apostle John is saying. And so it is true that where the spirit of God and where the spirit of truth is heard there the people of God may be found the hallmark of all true teaching is a following of true believers hallmark of all false teaching is a following of worldly followers the final tool then according to John is this this helpful hallmark. We must ask of those that we hear, we must ask of those who claim to be teaching 
on behalf of God, what kind of ministry does this person draw? What kind of people does this ministry draw? That's the question. And the Apostle John is saying, if you understand and use that question, you might you will be able to discern between false teachers and true teachers. What kind of people are attracted to this teaching ministry? What what kind of people are attracted to this teacher? And by that, you may know. Does it draw those who who are committed to the apostles' doctrine? Does it draw those, the kind of people who are committed to the studying of Scripture, to the service of Christ's people, to the preaching of the gospel, to the command to love love our neighbors? What kind of people does this ministry draw? There's the question. And by this we may know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. There's the third and final tool that the Apostle John gives us. And so in closing, as you think and as you take 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, as you take it with you this week, and as you seek to live in light of this text, here's what John has said. Number one, we have a duty to discern. And then number two, he follows up by giving us the tools for discernment. And our tools are a common Christian confession, a necessary reminder, and a helpful hallmark. So may I simply remind you and urge you this morning, do not believe everything you hear, but test the spirits to see whether or not they are from God.